Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to uh, Kyoto University at the Institute of Economics. We'd like to start session one, uh, historical perspective perspective of world order and mainly Asia. Um, I'd like to show the uh, four speakers. Um, at first, uh, Professor Fumihal Mieno, Professor Center of Southeast Asian Studies, Kyoto University. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mieno. And the second presenter is uh, Chris G. Pop, Professor Kyoto Women's University, uh, Kyoto. Um, thank you very much for coming, Chris Pop. And third is uh, from Korea, uh, Professor Sanchul Park, Professor Korea Polytechnic University from South Korea. Thank you very much for coming. And the fourth presenter is Pradeep Singh Chauhan, Associate Professor, Krukshatra University, CSSR, India. Thank you very much. So we have four presenters from Kyoto University, uh, from uh, Kyoto Women's University, and Korea Polytechnic University, and India, Krukshatra University. A very worldwide <laughs> Asian scholars and uh, American scholars as well. Each presenter uh, have 15 minutes uh, each. And after that, we'd like to make a discussion. So the first presenter is Professor Fumihal Mieno. Uh, he speak about the regional financial order and cooperation in Asia in 20th uh, first century, transformation of ASEAN financial system. So floor is yours, Fumihal Mieno. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Fumiharu Mieno from Kyoto University Center of Southeast Asian Studies, and also an uh, associate member of uh, so, uh, so Science Council of Japan. I'm very glad to have this chance to uh, talk here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, um, uh, to this, uh, this uh, the, uh, the symposium. I'm only uh, actually an economist and um, uh, uh, majored in the Asian economies and the financial development. Uh, today, I'd like to talk on the uh, Asian regional financial order issues in uh, 21st century. Uh, can I uh, share the my? Uh, okay, maybe I can do. I can. Make, uh, yes, we can. Okay. See. Okay. Okay. Yes, and uh, in the 21st century means that uh, the, in, the, in the context of the Asian financial, uh, financial system in, is that uh, the, the after the finan Asian financial, financial crisis in 1997. And um, then the, after the turmoil uh, of uh, the occurred in 1997, the argument occurs on what was wrong on Asian economy. And what is wrong? Uh, the simple, the first and the simple uh, uh, answer is that uh, distortion, uh, distorted uh, corporate and financial system in Asia. It was criticized by the uh, Washington consensus views uh, in very aggressively in that, uh, the early stage of the financial crisis. And the different view, uh, second different view is that uh, the, uh, the that uh, the Asian financial system, in, in, in particular, in, uh, Capital flow are uh, 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 excessively uh, uh, dependent or dependent on the, the U.S. data uh, system, so that, uh, uh, it incurs the uh, a rapid outflow of the capital in the some the, the timing. And the third one is that uh, immature financial system in Asia. Immature means that the financial system are uh, uh, mostly dominated the banking sector, and uh, there's some diversification are uh, uh, necessary necessary or something. Okay, and uh, the, in 2000, uh, the Asian financial cooperation schemes framework were uh, established by the, in, as a multilateral uh, cooperation uh, systems in ASEAN plus three framework. Plus three means that uh, China, Japan, and the Korea. And, uh, but actually this is that the initiative, uh, these initiatives are made by the, in Japan. 
and the, this uh, for cooperation uh, 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 framework uh, consists of uh, two two components. One is that the currency cooperation aspect that is that known as the Chenmai Initiative, and uh, it is that to stabilize that uh, regional financial capital flow by uh, uh, the tool of that the currency swap, swap scheme, uh, mainly by that uh, Chinese. Chinese renminbi yuan and the Japanese yen, and also uh, establishing uh, the monitoring schemes of that uh, each uh, of the of the uh, uh, multilateral countries, and uh, it has a uh, uh, named by the AMRO in Singapore, and uh, the regular regular monitoring uh, a, that is a regular monitoring unit. And second component of the Asian financial cooperation was um, is that. Uh, uh, bond market uh, development issues at the known as uh, the ABMI, ABMI being that the uh, Asian bond market initiatives. At the two, the goal is to diversify the financial channels from the uh, bank dominated one, in particular by the development of the bank bond market. And uh, uh, the, uh, the these schemes uh, provide a uh, technical assistance to the less developed countries and the rules and the institutions of the financial system, including a credit guarantee investment facility, uh, CGIF in Asian Development Bank. So this work um, uh, as a as major, uh, major factors of the uh, uh, financial cooperation and the orders in Asia in 2000. But uh, looking to the, the realities of the recovery process in 2000 were uh, something different from the, the financial side uh, um, uh, issues. Uh, that, uh, uh, the main concern is that uh, in after, after seeing that the uh, high recovery of the, the economy in Asia in 2000, uh, the question is that uh, Distorted corporate financial system, corporate and financial system really matters or not. That uh, uh, the Asian recover, recovery of the Asian economy is that uh, the mainly led by the export rate high growth and uh, also by manufacturing sectors or in some countries at the mining sectors. And uh, the, in, in there, uh, financial sector was actually a uh, the recovery of the financial sector delays so much, and uh, in fact, and the little contribution to the recovery process. Um, that, that, but in, on the other hand, uh, the financial system or the uh, inter, uh, capital flow structure is getting uh, turned to that very strong one, very strong and uh, uh, stable one. Um, it uh, uh, due to that the result of the real sector's export growth. Uh, 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 achievement. So, as a result of that, uh, the export-based growth that uh, the e many countries are turn from the, the capital recipient country to uh, capital exporters. The figure shows that uh, the example of the Thailand. Um, this side is at the inbound side, and this side is outbound side of the capital flow. So outbound sound means that uh, this is a uh, investment from Thailand to the rest of the world. This is that uh, the this uh, investment from the outside to uh, to Thailand. It's uh, as uh, clearly shown that the foreign reserve uh, in, in increase increases so highly, so so speedily after the, the mid 2000, and uh, the uh, due to that uh, the uh, uh, current. Uh, account uh, surplus. So, uh, as so that along with that, uh, the investment of the uh, uh, Thailand to the rest of the world increased so much. So now that Thailand, after mid 2000s, uh, the uh, the economy is that uh, not the capital recipient, net capital recipient, but the capital exporters. The situation situations are too much changes by the uh, reasons of the uh, real sector growth. So coming back to see that uh, the, the evaluate the achievement of the Asian co financial cooperation uh, in 2000, uh, what it uh, realized, did it realize? The currency cooperation side, I think that uh, the, the system of the uh, currency swap 
emergency uh, emergency loan uh, scheme, actually there's no experience result uh, uh, since the establishment, uh, even include the period of in the period of uh, Lehman shock. And uh, but uh, in, on the other hand, a continue uh, a very regular basis uh, dialogue among the uh, net uh, member countries, authorities, the currency authorities, authorities. Uh, uh, I think it's very meaningful they get that uh, the, there's a the information network of that uh, the uh, early warning of the macroeconomy or something. That is that uh, probably that the most important factors that STEM initiative uh, realized. Then, as, as I said, that uh, the, on the other hand, the stabilized financial order, uh, uh, recovered stability of financial order in Asia uh, is, uh, was that uh, not caused by that the scheme itself, but that by the drastically uh, improved capital flow uh, based on that uh, economic, uh, economic growth, real sector's growth. And on that uh, bond market development, development side, uh, actually, yes, and the bond market development were achieved to a degree. But uh, the problem might be that uh, the focus was uh, too narrow uh, as whole the uh, financial channel diversifications. Uh, probably that uh, the bond market development achieved to us uh, to some degree, and the probably next stage might be uh, uh, the different side, different directions, like such as. Um, uh, support a general development the local system in each country, and uh, including on the equity market or the bank lending or more or more basic financial systems. Uh, example, uh, in it is also in that 2000 years, uh, corporations that financial infrastructures, more fundamental financial infrastructures, are uh, 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 implemented by. Uh, uh, mainly by Japan, Korea, and also Malaysia to the neighbor countries. Um, uh, this example of that uh, Japan's cooperation to uh, the Myanmar, the Myanmar's uh, the democratization and economic reform process since 2011. Uh, at that time, that the major challenge to Myanmar, uh, it has many uh, challenges of the financial system reforms, such as uh, unifying the uh, multiple finance. Uh, uh, foreign exchange system and uh, creating uh, the interbank market. There's no interbank market there at the time. And uh, they're establishing uh, the bank, various types of bank regulation frameworks. And uh, uh, Japan, government Japan uh, provided uh, the bank uh, physical network system and settlement facilities among the central bank, the commercial bank, so forth. And also participated to the establishment of a securities exchange in Yangon, um, and with that the half of the stake of the, the, this company itself. And this type, this is the establishment of securities market or the capital market. This, these type of the corporations are found in Laos and Cambodia by Korea. Uh, such as fundamental uh, 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 corporations that uh, it might be on the basis of the stab, uh, stable uh, financial orders in the region. Okay. And but uh, the face seems to be changed after 2000, uh, 2010s, uh, the China, the China's emergence, China's outward expansion and uh, uh, China's big, uh, emerges as the big uh, powers and the uh, changing the, the game uh, in this field. Uh, uh, the Chinese government uh, uh, advo uh, advocated and uh, began to advocate it to uh, uh, internationalization of the renminbi, Chinese yuan, in the two early 2010s, and uh, uh, built under all the initiatives. And uh, in, however, um, it basically, I think, uh, could be understood in line with um, historically new, but uh, very standard international capital flows. That means that uh, 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 the emerging economies uh, by uh, uh, grown by the export-based uh, uh, manufacture, manufacturing uh, or industrializations, uh, in some stages the com uh, country or economies turn to turn from that uh, uh, capital recipient to a uh, uh, current account 
surplus countries. And that, as long, along with that, that the country or economy that turn to be a, be a capital exporter, investors. And in such, uh, and uh, they uh, emerges, uh, rather suddenly emerges as uh, the provider of this capital in the world. Uh, it has that experience in whole Japan in 1980s. And uh, 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 Asia, many ASEAN countries uh, uh, experience, uh, experience a similar ones in the country, like in Thailand, Malaysia, or so forth. But uh, so this is not on the very, uh, 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 it is actually very standard, I think. But uh, the process, standard process, I think. Due to that, uh, the, the unclearness of substance. I mean that uh, is built and road is aid of FDI. This is a concept is not very clear, and uh, uh, probably it's a mixture of them. And uh, the in, if it is at the aid, uh, the, there's a, 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 the actually a serious lack of transparency on the condition as aid, uh, interest rate and terms and the actual amount. Uh, advance, uh, amount is outstanding is not clear. Um, it, it, we, if we see that the dark criteria. Okay, so these are uh, uh, clearness may incur the new uh, external debt problem uh, uh, in the near future. So this is the one of the most anxious, uh, anxious, uh, anxious uh, issues. Uh, it might be uh, comparable to Latin American crisis in 1980s or Asian finance crisis in 1990s. And uh, I'll go back to that uh, the relation to the financial Asian financial cooperation framework. Uh, curiously, China still remained as the current cooperation framework. That is uh, against uh, actually basically originally against the U.S. dollar domi domination uh, domination. So that uh, uh, still that the position is not changed of China, and even that the take, rather taking over the initiative of that. And the financial channel diversification that the uh, Asian bond development issues, it uh, apparently now is at the new stage uh, of that. That China is this, uh, uh, over expansions of the, the bond issues and uh, sometimes recently that uh, the, uh, many uh, uh, default uh, uh, problem ha happened. So that the problem might be, uh, the target might, should be uh, diversified not from the only to only of the bond market, but to the more diversified ones. Okay, uh, at, at the ending remarks, I have three points for the The argument, the, this argument, uh, Asia Financial Order 2000, uh, 2020s. Uh, first one is that uh, uh, new factors, uh, the fintech. Uh, what the, the fintech innovation uh, is, uh, means, at what way it brings uh, uh, fintech innovation Asian or the world, uh, the world in financial world financial order, it might be uh, uh, it might change at the concept of the, the currency or uh, finance or even that the capitalism, but uh, it's not very clear that we need to that. Uh, 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 examines are very, very carefully and uh, with catch up, catching up that the reality. And secondly, the COVID. Uh, the COVID and uh, apparently there's apparent sign that uh, the fiscal burden uh, and uh, uh, increase of fiscal burden of the each country and the possible external debt crisis uh, in relation to the uh, debt on load initiatives. That problem has uh, uh, occurred even before the COVID-19 problem, but uh, the, this uh, COVID problem may uh, may uh, uh, make serious. It's uh, more serious, and uh, but uh, the COVID-19 probably might pro probably might be the fiscal problem, but not the financial problem, um, because of the damage um, probably damage to the financial system is rather limited in Asia. I, I believe. But it's a, it is a paradoxical consequence that uh, financial channels that uh, remain the shallow from that uh, actually, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, since that the Asian financial crisis. Okay, last of the last, um, the, the last of the last slide, um, the battery, uh, but, but uh, most importantly, 
uh, the new fact is that uh, we would, uh, uh, how to say, uh, are going to see that the re-emergence of the argument, financial order argument, uh, uh, over the economic regime and ideology issues. Ideology issue will come back, uh, coming back now. For example, um, the capital market issues, it, uh, as a, it's a guts of a, or heart of the capitalism. Uh, we recently witnessed that uh, the government intervention to the, in China, uh, the postponement of uh, IPO of anti-finance. Um, this is at the sudden government interventions such kind of the, the, the uh, arbitrary uh, intervention that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it bears that uh, the what how how the fight bears the issues of what the financial uh, order should be, and on the side, United States side, the United United States are now is the strongest thing that uh, regulation on the accountability of Chinese companies it's a uh, 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 taking back. Uh, uh, the Chinese companies to the uh, from the, uh, the capital market to the United States. This means that uh, the United States is uh, coming back to the fundamentalism of the capitalism, fundamentalism of the cap capitalism, and and the losing that the tolerance of the, the hybrid systems. Uh, the Hong Kong issue is that another one. But I mean that um, the I have to say. Um, the this these uh, phenomena suggest that uh, the uh, end of the tolerance to allow the hybrid system for the, the China, and uh, this is that uh, actually that the ideology issues. And another point, I, I will stop it here. Uh, a state-owned enterprise, a state ownership issues, that another part of the uh, ideology issues, uh, socialism or the capitalism, but but not to the socialism and the capitalism, but uh, also the Asian economic system and the Washington versus our system consensus issues. This is a mixture of that, uh, the, the very huge issues, but uh, it's based on that um, uh, the uh, ideology issues, which we have long time and they avoided the, the argument. So now, so as uh, a conclusion, the when we discuss that uh, uh, financial order in Asia in 2020s, we would inevitably uh, get into that ideology or uh, economic regime, socialism, or capitalism issues back again. Thank you very much. This is my talk. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mieno. It is so uh, comprehensive and informative presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, even though uh, the ASEAN have a uh, debt problem or uh, communist uh, Chinese uh, communist pressure, but it works very well um, comparing the East Asia. And that's why uh, we'd like to discuss uh, how Asian uh, ASEAN uh, collaboration needs work so uh, sustainably and well comparing the China, Japan, Korea. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. So next presenter is Professor Chris G. Pop, a professor of Kyoto Women's University. A title is Global System Collapse Under the New Post, uh, new post Recession uh, Settlement. Thank you very much. Please, uh, floor is yours, Professor Pop. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody from Kyoto. I'm not at Kyoto University. I'm uh, very close to Kiyo Mizudera at Kyoto Women's University today. And uh, uh, to give this presentation, I'd like to share the screen, if that's okay. So, uh, can I just check, uh, can, can we see the screen? Yes. Okay, well then, that's terrific. Uh, great. Okay, so um, excuse me. The uh, the presentation is about uh, what's necessary uh, for a new international uh, order, one that uh, can allow us to um, adapt and respond well to uh, the crises that beset the planet that are happening now and. Um, are going to um, if there are students listening. 
are going to be a, a major influence in your lives and the, the ma a major influence in the lives of our children. Um, this article was written before COVID, and I appreciate that COVID is an ascent is a is an extremely large problem now, but um, climate change is possibly much larger. And uh, uh, it was that crisis in particular I was thinking about when writing this um, presentation with this essay. So uh, the main points are that uh, I think this is an uncontroversial thing to say is that the international political economy is not sustainable. It's not economically. And uh, if it was economically, it isn't politically. Um, I should say I'm a political scientist. I dabble in political economics um, or political economy. So I'll be approaching this from a um, political science perspective. But uh, given that the room is full of uh, esteemed economists, I'm very interested in having a discussion about this. So anyone else's uh, presentation. Um, OK, to respond to the challenges ahead, an international settlement is necessary because without regulation and coordination in financial systems, um, it's unlikely to succeed. So why am I talking about a settlement? Well, as everyone will know, a, the last uh, major settlement, at least on a global scale, was uh, through Bretton Woods. Uh, a series of negotiations um, uh, carried out at Mount Washington Hotel in New Hampshire in 1944. Uh, which centered on the question of how to stabilize the economic world system. Now, you might think that at this time, the people here were concerned about how to prevent war. And no doubt they were. But this, the theme of this particular set of negotiations was how to prevent uh, another Great Depression. Uh, Great Depression is, uh, of course, uh, Dai Kyoko in 2020, uh, 2000, that would be 2008. Now, in 1929, um, because of the New Deal uh, perspective, uh, the politicians associated with the New Deal, that uh, economic collapse can lead to the kinds of political conflicts that uh, end up in war. And so it was a pacifist movement in a sense, but there was also realist politics at play. So the idea was to restructure international relations to safeguard, but also to safeguard capitalism from communism, yes, but more importantly from itself. Um, because without regulation, you will end up in uh, a crisis described very well by uh, uh, Galbraith, uh, where um, enormous um, kakusa, differences in wealth and, uh, and, um, and debt can lead to um, chronic instabilities in the market, which uh, lead to financial collapse and then a liquidity crisis. So the institutions they developed was an international monetary fund and the IBRD. Uh, this has kind of evolved and become the WTO. Uh, so sorry, the IBRD has become the World Bank and GATT and GATS has become the WTO. A little too simple, but uh, it's an easy way to remember. So the system that they created was called the Fixed Exchange Rate System, the Cote Solvase, and uh, this was where the dollar was tied to gold at $35 per ounce and all of the foreign currencies of people involved, countries involved, I should say, were allowed to um, uh, be about, uh, to appreciate or depreciate by 1% only. Um, this uh, linked all economies together such that um, the US was at times through its stimulus package accused of exporting inflation across Europe by uh, French politicians. Uh, the idea behind this was perhaps a little bit um, pacifist from the New Dealers. The, the people who in, um, enacted the New Deal in the US believed in social democratic reform as a means to ensure economic sustainability. But there was also realist foreign policy at play because the US were able to decide where their surpluses would go as the major economy after the, um, well, the horrors of the Second World War. And the country they chose, um, the countries they chose, I should say, were Germany and, and Europe, or maybe Europe through Germany, and then East Asia through Japan. But uh, because of the events on the Chinese mainland, um, the East Asia part of that, uh, that particular strategy was obscured a little bit. Um, and this is, uh, this is where the US trade relations come in. 
uh, with Japan. Okay, uh, the summary is perhaps best given by Theodore Roosevelt when he says the health of every country is a proper matter of concern to all its neighbors near and far. And I think this has uh, been established uh, in the previous presentation as well. Uh, and it's true. So I want to make sure I do this in the right time. Um, on the US side of negotiations, um, Harry Dexter Wright um, negotiated for a fixed exchange rate, basically. And on the British side, John Maynard Keynes asked for an international clearing union, a global currency, uh, to operate in a similar way as uh, special drawing rights um, operates today, a kind of artificial currency um, where all members could hold an account uh, at an international clearing bank, and then that bank could regulate the balance of surplus and deficits between countries. So you can have, uh, through taxation, uh, trade restrictions and investment payments. But it wasn't a completely, um, shall we say, not egalitarian. It wasn't completely about equality, as uh, people like Mike to remember. Um, it was to be based on a member share of world trade. Um, and uh, from a political perspective, it would certainly have entailed an enormous bureaucratization of policy and um, a technocratization of e uh, economics. But what happened was uh, Harry Dexter White side won, of course. And uh, um, this persisted relatively well. I mean, it, it helped um, Japan and Germany recover um, from, from the war, but uh, it and eventually came un became unraveled for a number of reasons. A uh, war in Vietnam, a huge stimulus um, package in the US as uh, US citizens were getting tired of economic difficulty and war. And traders in Europe um, sort of figured out how to undermine the currency system, which led to political tensions between the US and uh, European powers. So what happened is Nixon, uh, Richard Nixon, um, severs the tide to gold and uh, it causes an enormous rise in uh, commodity, in primary commodities. This is um, exacerbated by the oil shocks, leads to an enormous economic crisis all over the world. And for Volcker, um, for, for the US to deal with this, the head of the US Federal Reserve at the time, Paul Volcker, decided to lift the federal funds rate um, to arrest stagflation, which uh, you know less, led to industrial, uh, the loss of industrial occupancy in the US and huge unemployment. And, um, and this is where Reagan comes in and uh, in the 1980s, in the height of financialization and the gold rush, pioneers a high dollar policy which because there's so much debt existing in uh, foreign countries to be repaid in US dollars, uh, attenuates the world debt crisis. Federal debt crisis. So what happens in the 1980s is we see without uh, what's called the global surplus recycling mechanism, without the ability to recycle surpluses properly in the economy, uh, we have relatively unregulated global money markets. There are regulations indeed. Um, but uh, nothing in comparison to the previous system where money markets played a very um, mar uh, much smaller role. So anyway, uh, this changes uh, government, uh, corporate governance um, following uh, what's called the corporate raiders where um, uh, conglomerates use junk bonds to force hostile takeovers of undervalued corporations and so uh, in the US. And so to survive this, many uh, corporations decided to move to the shareholder a value maximization model, which uh, sort of um, makes it harder to carry out long-term investments when you have to ensure that you have profits every quarter. And uh, at the same time, it led to currency market volatility um, because uh, we, we had events uh, like the Asian financial crisis with the Thai baht, but also Black Tuesday, I think, in the UK, where um, the pound lost so much of its value overnight because it was um, described by a politician at the time, basically attacked. Uh, but this isn't just a reality for central banks. Central banks are actually relatively well placed compared to businesses who, who obviously don't have their own bank. So you, you end up finding that uh, people have to diversify assets and liabilities as much as possible, look for new suppliers and obviously expand their business by looking for new markets. At the same time, what was described indeed as the Washington consensus, 
um, and which was supported by the IMF conditionality for bailout packages for countries suffering from the Asian financial crisis and the debt crisis uh, of the third world before, and the end of the Cold War led to another billion added to the sort of um, increasingly neoliberal capitalist system that we live in. And now we're in a situation where, uh, to increasingly lesser extents, as I'll argue, the world is reliant on a US twin deficits because there's no real surplus cycling anymore. And this is because um, as countries um, export to the US, obviously they, uh, a lot of the time they need to pay their workers in the currency of the country where those workers are <clears throat> uh, working. And so by selling, <coughs> excuse me, by selling the dollar in order to pay them in local currencies, the value of the dollar goes down. And this is a problem for a, an export because relatively speaking, if this were to happen in Japan, this would mean endaka, the appreciation of the yen from a relative perspective. And so what central banks do is uh, they collect uh, US, foreign, uh, US dollars as forex uh, reserves. And uh, in order to not sort of uh, have too much of this, they, they buy the safest possible thing they can invest. And uh, that gen the lowest risk uh, thing that you can buy, generally speaking, is a US bond because the demand for the dollar is always there because the dollar is used as a de facto global currency. So in identifying the crises, and uh, perhaps I'm running out of time as I had last time, um, we have an overextension of finance. We have uh, uh, two ways that uh, countries have dealt with uh, the layman shock. And one was an expansion of credit into strategic areas to boost demand. And others was austerity programs. Many countries did both, but this has been the, the, um, the general thrust of, uh, of um, countermeasures to the layman shock. And uh, we found that uh, a lot of countries are in what's described as a um, crisis. We have uh, zero interest rates, negative interest rates, which of course there's a limit on this because if it turns into capital controls at commercial banks, people could withdraw their money. Um, we have a deregulation of finance and labor to attract businesses to the country and uh, a management of asset bubbles. So um, for example, what the UK and will do to a lesser uh, to a much greater extent than Japan is to um, manage an asset bubble for assets that maintain the value once purchased, purchased, but have low possible prices for consumables that uh, lose their values once consumed. And this has attenuated an enormous sort of uh, problem, a wealth divide in the country as it has everywhere else. So I'm going to skip this bit because I want to make sure that I can uh, make the points that I want to make today. Uh, I identified in the piece another crisis as the migration crisis, um, which is related to war and economic hardship and climate change. There's 25.4 million refugees worldwide. Uh, I, I hope we're all aware of what's happening in the EU and uh, how many drown, in, including children and babies in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, you know, uh, well, there's uh, terrible things in countries like Libya, like open slave markets that people are trying to escape from and uh, they're, they're not given help, which is a crisis given that uh, economic hardship and climate change in the future is going to increase pressures for migration. And also there's a deregulation of labor. Um, for example, um, there are, okay, there's many examples in the United States and Europe. Um, uh, prison labor, for example, is one. Um, uh, this happens in the UK as well. 75% uh, of the global workforce is in precarious employment. So um, I'm, I'm, I may be a fixed term assistant professor, but by um, the, the, the standards of the, of the world, I'm in a relatively privileged position. Uh, compared to a lot of people, including 11% of the world's children who undertake child labor. So my argument is that the liberalization of capital flows and technological innovation has accelerated financialization beyond the time horizons necessary for effective policymaking. So corporate 
restructuring has been basically the order of the day, and this is a vetted worker in security because of the shareholder value maximization model. This uh, means that developed countries now sustain large current account deficits, which is troublesome, I guess, if you want to internationalize your currency, for example. So income distribution has shifted in favor of capital and it's stripped away the means by which workers can protect themselves. There's uh, little union activity, little collective bargaining, wage suppression, welfare cuts, social security cuts, and labor flexibilization to adjust price levels. This has been particularly pernicious in the periphery of the European Union because of the inability of um, these countries to uh, print money in order to uh, adjust price levels. So they end up having to deleverage by flexibilizing labor and uh, selling off uh, cultural assets and things like this. Okay, the final thing I wanted to talk about, of course, was climate change. Um, we're all aware of it. Um, the argument I make on this slide is that it's much worse than the IPCC, uh, so the IPCC, yes, um, tend to uh, report because of the um, natural and correct conservatism that scientists generally hold about making assessments. But um, the current targets assume there are no, um, the current target of 1.5 degrees Celsius um, before uh, pre-industrial uh, before pre-industrial levels to be met, 45% of carbon emissions from 2010 levels must be reduced in 10 years. They've gone up, obviously, in this last 10 years by a long way. Um, and it must come down to zero by 2050. And this is assuming that there are no tipping elements uh, where the world could, uh, uh, could lead to a cascading set of events where no matter what we do to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it, the temperature just keeps on increasing anyway, possibly to levels uh, um, where we can't survive physically on the planet. And um, it's happened before. So it's, it's worth taking seriously. So even if the Paris Agreement is successful, there are predictions that the planet will warm by, uh, I think, three degrees. Sorry, I can't see for the slide. 3.4 degrees by 2100. Assuming carbon feedback loops, this could be over four degrees Celsius. That This would be um, chaos. I argue that there's a, an economic connection, and indeed there is. Um, for example, the Global Security Review um, indicates that the global economy will double in size in 22 years if modest annual, uh, if there's a modest annual growth. This has probably changed since the coronavirus, but it makes the point that it's not just a climate crisis; it's a crisis of the entire um, socio-ecological system. This would, if the economy were to double in size, it would damage phosphorus and nitrogen cycles, global fresh water supplies, land use, abet ocean acidification, biodiversity loss animal extinction and climate change. Um, so there's two ideas about how to respond. Is this a problem of overaccumulation? Are we consuming too much? Or is this a problem of underconsumption? Can we use green growth to get out of this problem? Well, my argument uh, that I make in the article that's, uh, I hope, uh, since been put online is that uh, there's a need for um, international coordination, particularly if it's a problem of uh, underconsumption. Uh, and this was made clear by the UN in 2009 after the um, Lehman shock, after the great financial crisis. It is clear that current institutions and arrangements governing globalization and many national government policies have been based on a certain set of ideas and idea ideologies, while other ideas which might have been more helpful in avoiding the crisis and mitigating its size were overlooked. The, si the ideas and ideologies underlying key aspects of what has various been, been called neoliberal market fundamentalism or the Washington consensus have been found wanting. So there's been a call for a new monetary globalism uh, not just by the UN, but by the former IMF chief Dominic Strauss-Kahn, by the uh, finance minister of the uh, People's Republic of China, uh, and indeed others. Um, so the UN calls for a true, truly global currency to overcome the fiduciary dollar standard, in many ways the same as what Keynes recommended in 1944. Um, and this is necessary, uh, I argue, because it allows um, central banks and businesses to focus on long-term investments uh, designed at welfare enhancement.
And uh, my suggestion perhaps is that the Bank of International Settlements could provide better oversight of these investments. And the reason why it might be time to talk about this, or indeed it is, is because it's already happening. We can see the um, multipolarization of currencies, the, uh, of currency regimes, the internationalization of currencies. Uh, even the EU during the Donald Trump era talked about the creation of a new swift payment system uh, when the US, uh, US uh, pulled out of the Iranian nu uh, nuclear agreement, um, meaning that more, and asked companies to denominate exports in non-US currencies. China has done many things. Uh, one of them, which I thought was interesting in 2018, was launching a, of a UN denominated crude futures contract on the Shanghai International Energy Exchange. But uh, the internationalization of uh, the renminbi is uh, well documented, I think. Okay, um, I will try and be uh, very quick here. Um, so if we look at what could a monetary, new monetary regime do for current solutions to these problems, we have to identify what solutions there are. There's the UNSCGs, which everyone's excited about. And uh, these follow off the back of the uh, Millennium Development Goals in 2000, which were somewhat successful. But uh, the International Council for Science and the International Social Science Council warns us that without clarification and quantification of targets, countries will struggle to achieve them or even demonstrate categorically and empirically that significant progress has been made. At the same time, however, um, quantifying these targets can oversimplify them. Uh, for example, uh, the Millennium Development Goals were very successful in um, bringing countries over the poverty line. But this poverty line is calculated by the World Bank at $1.9 a day. And this is adjusted for purchasing power of each country. So it's, um, it's, it, it's as if to say, if you make $1.91 a day, you can live in the US out of poverty, which is, of course, not true. Um, poorly designed metrics run the risk of oversimplifying complex social issues like poverty and limit improvements in people's conditions. I argue, as I say in the uh, article, that a better regulation and international coordination in currencies can provide long-term investments um, that can uh, better um, achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, there's the Green New Deal, which is very, very interested uh, very, very interesting, but it is limited to the political context in which we live. The Gilets Jaunes protest in France, uh, one slogan was Macron is worried about the end of the world, we're worried about the end of the month. There's no way that you can address uh, oncoming climate change without addressing uh, wealth divide and economic inequalities that exist today. So my argument is that uh, to address the crisis at the heart of the IP, we need multilateral global coordination. This can be achieved through the UN SDGs or the Green New Deal, but there needs to be financial coordination at the same time. I argue that this can happen through uh, a, a kind of post Lehman shock settlement. New Deal has understood that the IPE, the international political economy is unsustainable without oversight and regulation and sought to strategically recycle surpluses. Today, that's not happening because of the floating exchange rate system to anywhere near an effective rate to um, achieve sustainability. And so um, instigating a global currency regime is indeed a political project, but not doing so is ideological and political also. And with the internationalization of currencies, I think it's something, I think it's time for countries to seriously consider this, not least given that the US, UN has recommended it. Um, so it's beneficial to the UN SDGs as deficit areas will receive surpluses for long-term sustainability investments and to the Green New Deal because it provides a discussion point for internationalizing the Green New Deal. As New Dealers, the original New Dealers themselves knew was necessary to safeguard capitalism and uh, world war. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I apologize if that was a bit rushed, but that's the general thrust of my argument, and I hope it's uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, very huge and 
um, worldwide uh, investigation, uh, especially you are, I thought you are a political scientist, but today you spoke many about the political economic uh, um, investigation, uh, starting from the death of Bretton Woods system to Lehman shock crisis. And you uh, mentioned about the uh, millennium poverty or migrant uh, migrant uh, uh, question or socio economic uh, socio ecological question as well so perhaps uh, how to reorganize the new world order and by whom might be very important i think and you mentioned the un sdgs but perhaps we ourselves the asian also can organize well to the uh, new crisis. So perhaps now uh, we'd like to ask Professor uh, Sancho Park, uh, who is speak about the uh, Asian regional cooperation, especially RCEP and CPTTP strategy. Uh, Professor Sancho Park is Korean uh, Polytechnic University and very famous in Europe as well. Uh, he works in Sweden or other European countries as well. So floor is yours, Sancho Park. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me, Professor Haber. And uh, it is uh, uh, very meaningful for me to participate in a Kyoto conference because I worked at uh, Okayama University as associate professor from 2003 to 2006. Currently, uh, I'm serving uh, as an uh, advice uh, member uh, of uh, South Korean Presidential Committee uh, for a certain bound policy. So my presentation is pretty much linked to uh, the present Presidential Committee uh, where I have uh, worked so far. So I hope all of you are uh, looking at uh, my presentation file, right? Yes. Okay, yes. good. So as uh, Professor Haba pointed out, I like to focus particularly on the Asian regional cooperation uh, based on two mega FTA such as RCEP and TPP, turn to now CPTPP uh, strategy. So if I uh, explain you in the introduction part uh, shortly uh, regarding the uh, trade and the investment, the uh, global trade growth uh, has been slowed down pretty much uh, since the uh, global financial crisis in 2008. But we experienced it a ton to uh, upright swing, uh, particularly in uh, year 2016. But since the Trump administration, it turned to slow down again. So if we look at the in 2017 and 19, the two uh, global economic institutions, such as uh, WTO, IMF, estimated only 2.4 to 3.8% increase in 2017, but the last year it was even worse as 1.4 and 3.2%. And this year, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, we expect minus 10% of global trade growth that will affect the global economy pretty severe. So slowing down in advanced as well as emerging markets uh, even in uh, 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 East Asian countries. So world trade growth from the uh, last uh, 30 years long, we see the one point times higher than the world GDP growth. It means the global trade has contributed uh, to the, the real economic growth uh, at the global scale. So. Uh, but the, what, what's happening is uh, since the uh, global financial crisis, 
we see more or less equal since the global finance crisis as like this graphic shows. So since the 2008, the trade growth and the global economic growth have been more or less the same. That means the global trade has been shrunk dramatically. So since the 1990s, we see a clear changing trade pattern. Number one is shifting intensity of economic growth from west to east. It means mainly uh, in East Asia, certainly including uh, uh, East, uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. Secondly, we see increased linkage of supply chain between developed and developing countries, so-called global value chains. And we also see a proliferating FTAs, particularly in Asia, so a bilateral FTA, uh, as well as mega FTA, 147 among 228 FTAs have been completed in East Asian territory. So mega FTAs in Asia and Pacific, uh, such as R7 TPP, but TPP on the Trump administration in uh, 2017, as you know, uh, the USA uh, withdrew from the TPP. So post the vision of a TPP without USA participation resulted in CPTPP led by Japan. So my research questions are number one, what are mega FTAs for Asian economy? Secondly, what are roles of R7 CPTPP in the uh, Asian economic integration? Finally, what are implications for East Asian economy cooperation. Are these two mega FTA uh, pretty much important uh, for East Asian uh, economic cooperation or not? So theoretical debates I like to skip except explain one thing. The East, the Asian economic uh, integration and cooperations are uh, rather uh, regarded as a regionalization instead of a regionalism, what the Western world are strongly focusing based on legal uh, uh, assistance. So Asian economic cooperation is uh, characteristically uh, pretty much different uh, compared to the uh, Western world. So let's look at the mega FTA uh, in uh, Asia Pacific region. So the Japanese uh, presenter uh, touched upon a uh, little bit about the uh, uh, ASEAN plus six in ASEAN. Uh, plus six is uh, uh, including uh, India, Australia, and New Zealand. The, uh, uh, Korea initiated ASEAN plus three first, and then later Japan initiated uh, ASEAN plus six. So we both agree that it's all right. We cooperate comprehensively, including Oceanian region. So region-wide FDA in East Asia uh, is the uh, RSA, a true a regional-wide FDA in East Asia, first time in Asian history. So ASEAN centrality uh, existing, uh, is ex existing strongly, and uh, China's motivation against TPP uh, is the uh, real reason behind. So, what is the guideline principles? The RCEP try to follow the WTO consistency, transparency, and open access to ASEAN FTA partners. I show you a figure later. So these uh, principles targeting to reassure the world free trade commitment because Trump administration, in fact, made a mess the uh, global structure or a trade order. So we try at least to keep the uh, traditional uh, the uh, free trade uh, commitment because all of Asian countries have been uh, profited uh, from the uh, from the, the free trade uh, uh, agreement or commitment, and certainly the West of world uh, as well. So rescheduling to complete in uh, 2017, but delayed continuously and finally completed this year in November, 
uh, unfortunately, without Indian participation. There are several reasons, uh, but uh, I will discuss later if someone asks me. And continuously, we see the strong arrival to TPP in terms of economics, such as population, GDP, and trade volumes. But unfortunately, uh, with the withdrawal of the USA, the uh, RCEP is overwhelmed position compared to a CPTPP because the US portion accounted for more than 65% of the entire TPP. So this uh, map shows uh, which part belongs to RCEP and the other part belongs to TPP. But uh, uh, six nations, uh, uh, rather, uh, uh, rather seven nations uh, are participating in both uh, mega uh, FTA. And this graphic shows uh, the, uh, uh, the size of the economic size of uh, RCEP uh, uh, 60 member nations. The uh, total GDP uh, uh, account for uh, around uh, over 31%. But trade volume is more than uh, 45% and uh, nearly half of the entire population in the world. But as I said, unfortunately, except the India, the portion of population declined uh, substantially. So RCEP is a tool for rising China in the region, in fact. So dramatic changing prospect of RCEP after the US withdrawal from TPP uh, January uh, 2017. So, in fact, the RCEP has become the opening door for China to play more pronounced roles uh, in the region and gaining new opportunities at the same time uh, to expand trade and investment in even TPP markets such as Canada, Mexico, Chile, and so on, and continuously expanding RCEP to the Pacific region in uh, Chile and Peru, uh, what China is uh, intending uh, pretty strongly. So it enhances China's roles in uh, regional and global trade, and at the same time, uh, supporting ASEAN to complete RCEP in 2020 and completed uh, in November itself. And particularly, China is uh, trying to uh, set the trade rules uh, in the region without India. So let us look at the, then the TPP, uh, turn to the CPTPP later, I explain continuously. So US participation on the Obama administration in 2010. The core reason why the US, USA turned to Asia is on the name of Asia pivot policy. The Asia, particularly East Asia, has the highest possibility to create the double higher economic growth than average of a world economic growth next two decades. So if you miss Asia as a market or a corporation partner, your economic growth will be damaged more or less, or uh, you will lose momentum to grow continuously uh, uh, in the uh, uh, future, next 20 years. That's the core reason. So USA, realized more than 95% of population and 80% of purchasing power outside USA existing. So importance of Asia Pacific region has become the most growing consumption power in the future, as I told you. So TPP as a tool for USA to influence further in the region, and it is a mechanism at the same time for isolating China in East Asia. So the significant economic position uh, of a TPP is uh, uh, only the uh, uh, GDP portion is higher than the uh, RCEP, uh, but uh, lower than uh, the uh, trade values. But uh, if you count on uh, USA participation, uh, two mega FTA could compete with uh, each other and at the same time, cooperate with uh, each other depending on uh, US policy as well as uh, Chinese policy. So TPP negotiating in 2010, completed 2015, 
and signed in uh, 2016, first time uh, in Japan under Abe's decision. But as you know, unfortunately, Trump administration withdrew. So it is impossible to uh, password of TPP to enter into force without U.S. participation because of Article 30.5. It says at least six members accounting for 85% of the GDP in the total GDP ratifying before the agreement enters into force. But CPTPP has to change uh, this Article 35 uh, in order to form uh, new types of uh, mega FTA. So uh, uh, the reason why the uh, uh, USA could do uh, such a strong article is uh, US economic uh, uh, portion uh, in the uh, uh, TPP uh, as a whole, because its portion accounted for, as said, nearly 65% uh, as uh, this uh, graphic shows the Japanese portion in the CP, uh, TPP accounted for uh, nearly 17 uh, percent. So with the withdrawal of the USA, the CPTPP has become shrunken one third of the uh, total uh, portion. So CPTPP could have a very difficult position uh, to compete with RCEP. Uh, I, I show you later continuously. So. U.S. trade policy principles on the Trump administration, or as all of you know, just uh, bilateralism and uh, America first uh, policy. So this uh, destroyed entire uh, free trade mechanism organized by uh, WTO, and uh, uh, even uh, USA tries has tried to remove from the uh, from the WTO. Then now what's happening is we expect a new Biden's administration uh, next year, 20th of January. So U.S. return to TPP on the Biden's administration, I think it's fully possible, but it must uh, have some kind of struggle and new negotiations, particularly uh, with uh, Japan and uh, other partners. So let us analyze uh, the both the uh, mega FTA. First of all, the, uh, if you look at the uh, both mega FTA, uh, generally speaking or specifically, the all East Asian countries' economic interests are attached to RCEP much higher than TPP. Uh, based on a CG model. I show you the statistical database uh, later. So global G uh, GDP share, the RCEP uh, is lower than uh, TPP as said, but the trade volume is uh, higher uh, than uh, TPP. But if you compare to CPTPP, the CPTPP uh, uh, cannot be comparable with the RCEP in terms of economic size because the CPTPP has only 12.6% uh, uh, of uh, global share, uh, while the uh, RCEP has over 31%. Uh, so it's uh, uh, much higher than uh, uh, double uh, sized. So th uh, this is the, uh, the fact between two uh, mega FTAs. So as uh, this uh, table shows, the trend of trade uh, RCEP and member nations are uh, very closely linked to the uh, RCEP compared to, uh, compared to uh, uh, TPP as uh, this uh, table two uh, shows. So trade volume within the uh, RCEP 16 member nations uh, have been uh, strongly interacted within the region uh, that all statistical uh, data uh, shows. So what are implications for East Asian economic cooperation based on two uh, mega FTA? Number one, I see the economic benefits based on CG model. RCEP is three times uh, more uh, linked to the uh, RCEP member nations. For instance, RCEP generates uh, 644 billion US dollars in 2025, while TPP uh, can create 
$223 billion, just around one third. And the mega FTAs, reducing noodle bowl effects of overlapping uh, bilateral FTAs in the region. This is the core, one of the core reasons why all uh, 16 member nations uh, are keen to complete the RCBs. East Asian nations have completed bilateral um, uh, FDA, uh, one another too many. So there are the, uh, several the, uh, regulations overlap. So if we do not complete uh, uh, the entire mega FDA, we cannot serve this kind of a noodle ball effects, which means complicated the uh, regulation uh, the uh, crash uh, cannot be served at once. So we need to complete the mega FTA uh, region-wide. Then we can uh, uh, serve entire trade conflict problems uh, pretty easily. So it, it, uh, increasing trade volumes and strengthening trade uh, uh, by completing the mega FTAs, that uh, means interdependence and regional economic integration uh, can be strengthened and uh, uh, intensified uh, in the near future. So increasing East Asian countries' interdependency is needed compared to other major economic blocks such as the European Union, as well as uh, NAFTA, which turn to now the US, uh, Mexic US, US Mexico, Canada. So all 16 member nations are highly dependent on RCEP, much more than TPP. Only USA depend, uh, uh, dependency uh, on TPP uh, is higher than uh, RCEP, if you look at the, uh, this uh, uh, table. Uh, uh, so the, uh, all uh, 16 uh, member nations do have much higher the economic uh, dependencies within the uh, member nations uh, than the uh, TPP. So major implications for East Asian economic cooperation is number one. It is absolutely needed to establish a solid platform for regional economic integration because we have heard many times the globalization. But if you look at the inside of globalization, we also see the regionalization at the same time. Regionalization means the fostering the market. If you look at the uh, European Union and uh, US, Mexico, uh, uh, Canada, the free trade agreement. And secondly, the RCEP contributing to liberalize trade investment in the region, particularly in China, India, Indonesia, Unfortunately, India uh, 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 is still uh, uh, thinking about uh, the uh, re-entering or not, as like the USA in the uh, CPTPP. And RCEP is a pathway to create the free trade area in Asia Pacific, FTA, AP as a whole uh, in the uh, future. Because uh, APEC, APEC is a too broad, uh, therefore, uh, APEC has existed longer than two decades, but uh, in fact, the economic cooperation uh, has been pretty much uh, limited. So we are uh, experiencing uh, this uh, as well in the historical context. So my conclusion remarks are number one, trade and investments are key uh, keys for world economic growth last five decades and we have experienced. Secondly, changing trade environment since the global financial crisis in 2008, and we are aware of it. Number three, mega FTAs in the Asia Pacific region as a new trend, and we have to uh, catch uh, our uh, the, uh, uh, great opportunities to move forward continuously and to form the Asian uh, regional economic integration and cooperation. So RCEP has opportunities for Asia Pacific region, that's the fact. And TPP replaced by RCEP with 
uh, U.S. withdrawal in the region. So, uh, unfortunately, CPTPP uh, plays much smaller role than expected, but we do not know exactly what can happen if U.S. joins the CPTPP uh, once again. Then the content is uh, uh, content must be different compared to the TPP. This is the reason why the recently the Chinese Xi Jinping addressed China is ready to participate in uh, in the CPTPP as well. So finally, the intensifying regional economic integration in East Asia with RCEP is pretty much clear. That's all. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, thank you very much, Professor Park. Uh, excellent presentation, uh, very interesting and uh, hopeful presentation that East Asia can uh, collaborate together, uh, RCEP and the CPTTP, or in the future, TPP with. Uh, U.S. or uh, China as well. Uh, it is said um, such a big regional cooperation, a driver's seat, uh, Korea will sit, <laughs> or ASEAN uh, countries will sit. Uh, so perhaps uh, we can consider, uh, even though there is a political problem uh, each other, or a historical problem each other, we can start from such an economic uh, mega FTA, uh, such as RCEP and uh, CPP, um, perhaps uh, TPP. So perhaps why India is outside from the uh, RCEP or how to organize uh, South Asia? The next speaker will be uh, uh, Professor Chauhan. So thank you very much, Professor Park. Uh, excellent presentation and um, now, thank, you. thank you thank you very much now we'd like to the last presenter professor uh, Pradeep Singh Chauham associate professor Krukshatra University and a member of CSSR like uh, Indian SCJ uh, he speak uh, Dusak and Bimstek lead the world regional collaboration in South Asia. So uh, please, uh, Professor Chauhan, floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Abba, for giving me this opportunity, wonderful opportunity today. And thanks to Goethe University, Professor Nizobeta. Uh, yeah, uh, it was a wonderful presentation by Professor uh, Park about uh, this RCEP and CTPPP. And uh, I also raised one question, what is his opinion about like uh, why India uh, decided to be out from RCEP, which is such a comprehensive or we can say the biggest uh, regional integration partnership. So, uh, yeah, uh, I would like to give some uh, point of view, which in uh, uh, India consider like uh, why they are out from this, uh, such a comprehensive uh, treaty. Uh, so, as uh, Professor Habba told that uh, I would be giving a, a brief uh, review how South Asia can contribute uh, in the new world order, how can they, the SAC and BIMSTEC lead the world or regional cooperation. So, uh, yeah, start with like, uh, uh, what are the challenges of integration in South Asia and how uh, the challenges will play a role in the new economic order and uh, 
how BIMSTEC and SARC will play their role, how India can be the bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia, I would be discussing that, and the uh, need to develop this regional cooperation with the integration of South Asia and how BIMSTEC can be a vehicle for that, okay? So just uh, giving brief about what is like happening or happened in South Asia. And uh, South Asia, which is one of the, we can say world's most dynamic and diverse regions and uh, they share regional uh, let motif along with cultural, linguistic, topographical, economic diversity lends the region a distinct identity. Its economies have like demonstrated remarkably, uh, remarkable strength and resilience amid even the global slowdown. Even in the global slowdown, Indian economy was flourishing uh, with more than 5% rate of growth after 2008. And uh, yet, uh, aside from the collective experience, we can say of economic growth, the region also shares some developmental challenges. And uh, the, uh, you can say the uh, deeper regional integration like Europe or little bit, you can say about the Southeast Asia and uh, the, North uh, America, India, uh, the South Asia also had experience with the inception of like multiple institutional framework for uh, advancing this regional cooperation, such as like the SARC, South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation now with eight members. Um, if I repeat like India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, now a new member, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. And the, due to some uh, problems, I will discuss a little bit about the functioning of the SA. The other organization, which we call the BIMSTEC, BIMSTEC start with Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral uh, Technical and Economic Cooperation. So in BIMSTEC, many members are overlapping, except like uh, the Thailand and Myanmar. So how the these Bay of uh, Bengal initiative will be a bridge between South Asia and South, Southeast Asia, we will discuss later on. So with the vision to globally uh, transition towards the South Asian economic union characterized by common market or custom and economic and monetary union, SARC facilitated the inception of South Asian free trade area, which we call a SAFTA, which was operationalized in 2006. But still, uh, after so many years, more than 14 years, the uh, SAFTA you know, if we call it inter-regional trade of SAFTA is just 5% of the South Asian total trade compared to approximately 25% of the Asian. One of the biggest factor uh, undermining inter-regional trade is the long sensitive list of like products uh, exempted by South Asian countries from the tariff liberalization program in the region. The average state costs within South Asia are 20% higher than the corresponding costs within Asia. Persisting high trade costs, the proliferation of uh, multiple non-tariff and para-tariff barriers, poor trade facilitation at borders, lengthy sensitive list and high connectivity costs continue to offset the positive impact of geography and proximity. Uh, what are the challenges of integration in the region in South Asia? The challenges related to diversity and integration are complex, but not exclusive to the region. Although European integration comes from the Second World War, cooperation in South Asia arose from 
we can say the polarized atmosphere of the cold war with the very different geopolitical context the european union had managed to overcome regional disputes particularly between country like france and germany the creation of asean has been a milestone in promoting regional integration in southeast asia which is has come you know through multiple tools such as asean plus 3 asean plus 6 as well as like als bilateral between asean and neighboring countries among others the regional comprehensive economic uh, pa participation like uh, partnership were, as professor park was discussing in detail about that was the last of the major addition although india has so far remained on the margin of this agreement uh, 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 just mentioning why what india is thinking about this rcep the major uh, reason of not joining is like china because uh, uh, this is they call it is it will be a uh, problematic for india to resist china because already uh, from the Uh, trade deficit if we see uh, almost half trade deficit of india is with china so uh, so that is a fear for, for the local producer local markets that china will overcome the indian market if this they will join rcep that is uh, one major reason india is giving so uh, the most important contribution of these regional co cooperation was the facilitation and restructuring of the sector which seeks efficiency across the region to promote economies of scale specialization and competitiveness but in uh, although uh, about the rcep japan is doing its best uh, and uh, still japan uh, stress that india should be an observer and kept an option open for india that they can join later if the rcep and the, their its members could resolve their doubts about the uh, india's questions regarding rceps so uh, sark and bimstack now uh, how mean they can lead the world as this i i i mentioned earlier the sub region shared colonial past and popular cultural preferences including prolific uh, culinary understands vibrant entertainment industries and common sports reinforce a south asian identity and offer compelling cross border drivers for better connectivity exploiting them by promoting intra regional tourism and direct interaction between people can help counteract confidence deficits and negative stereotype as well as create a bulwark for lasting regional peace reconciliation and collaboration above all shared political will be incremental but tangible measures to anchor deeper integration have the potential to significantly strengthen cooperation in south asia as the region moves uh, forward with an alter more external economic orientation greater economic integration and cooperation fueled by increased intra regional trade and investment promises that india uh, so south asia will realize its true growth potential in light of global events around like brexit the uh, trans pacific partnership and nafta that reflect the erosion of trust in existing multilateral collaborative framework south asia can provide the world with a new context for regional collaboration and revive the hope for a coherent and sustainable world order as the region largest economy Uh, of uh, south asia particularly india has the opportunity to pave the way for regional multilateralism through mutual interest as i discussed that india uh, uh, particularly in south asia can be bridge between south asia and southeast asia 
geographically many people would be uh, really get would get some information that india is strategically positioned in south asia it is the only state that enjoy direct physical contact with all state in the region uh, uh, com- uh, most of the uh, sarc members are on the borders of india its central position within the region allow it to be a bridge between south asian economy likes bangladesh pakistan sri lanka nepal bhutan and the south asian economies so the all the all these uh, uh, some members like nepal and bhutan which are the two land locked states can also have the access to south east asia region through india so over the year there have been several sub regional initiative taking in two regions which i mentioned briefly like the sub regional economic cooperation of south asia the gulf of bengal initiative for multi sectoral and technical uh, economic cooperation like bimstack i mentioned similarly bangladesh china india mmr bcim initiative uh, and india is a common factor in that so india has strategically very important uh, role to play uh, and uh, there are some physical connections india can provide due to its landscape like uh, the 1360 km long road between more moe sort will pass through mandale and link northeast india and southeast asia this route could then easily connect with kaladam multimodal transit projects that would link kolkata port with land locked mizoram the mizoram which is one of the state uh, north east state of india via myanmar into economic highways with special economic zones so none of the these sub region initiative undertaken to enhance road connectivity between india and south east asia region and uh, like the mcgong uh, india economic corridor bangladesh china india mmr economic corridor and the bay of bengal initiative like bimstack has yet resulted in that uh, tangible tangible progress so there is a uh, need for regional cooperation to promote more integration uh, where, which is uh, under progress like if you see the a south asian region cover about 3% of the world's total land area and is home to 21% of the population so which which uh, signifies its importance so south asia extend over a last vast land area between the mighty himalayas in the north and indian ocean in the south so these are some important we can say uh, teachers so but now india is like uh, moving towards bim stack more due to some uh, problems like in indo pakistan border problems so uh, even today there is no dialogue between india and pakistan and sarc it stand still because of that so now india is looking towards this way pathway going in bim stack so where pakistan is not Uh, the member of bimstack so bimstack uh, i mentioned includes country uh, some of the sarc countries uh, and thailand and myanmar is new member uh, in addition to like bangladesh india sri lanka and uh, laterly nepal and bhutan the uh, commercial block bimstack covers many opportunities the region has a country with the fastest growing economy in the world the combined gdp in the region is around like uh, more than 3 and 1/2 trillion dollars and is likely to grow even more so uh, there are many statistics we can show but uh, uh, in brief i would like to say that 
India has more interest now in BIMSTEC and uh, BIMSTEC can be like a link between South Asia and Southeast Asia and then uh, in the more comprehensive integration of the world. So just uh, to conclude it that the South Asia can uh, no doubt can play a leading role in the world because of its special characteristics. I, as I mentioned, these two organizations can play a very important role, SAC and BIMSTEC. And uh, insofar as their reasons of interest overlap, SARC and BIMSTEC complement each other in terms of functions and goal. So uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, there is uh, one question uh, still stand that if these two reasons can play more important role by uh, joining uh, like the uh, RCEP. So, but uh, uh, currently they, they, there are some doubts uh, of India if uh, the member state can solve these uh, doubts. So no doubt the South Asia can play very important role in all this larger integration and a new uh, world order. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Chauhan. Uh, it is very, very interesting about the SARC and uh, Vimustec. I'm uh, very much uh, concentrated about the South Asian regional collaboration. It might be very important because you have uh, 1.4 billion people and rising power. So if your country and China collaborate and ASEAN and Japan, Korea is also collaborate like RCEP, we will become the um, biggest economic collaboration and do Asian leads the world and prosperity. So that's why it is very important to organize the South Asian uh, people and the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the time is almost over, but uh, at last uh, I'd like to ask only one minute um, question each uh, to speak about the <clears throat> what is the secret of success to collaborate Asian people, even though there is a, a conflict or instability. Uh, the, uh, Professor Mieno spoke of uh, ASEAN financial collaboration and uh, Chris Pope spoke about the UN SDGs and Professor Park speak RCEP and the CPTTP and Professor uh, Chauhan spoke SARC and uh, BIMSTEC. So, uh, but even though there is uh, many problems in each countries and each region, uh, there is a conflict or uh, some historical problem or uh, government uh, uh, reconciliation is not easy. So how to conquer that problem and how to make a mutual understanding and economic collaboration uh, and what is the secret of uh, the um, making organize such a uh, very important uh, uh, regional collaboration like uh, RCEP, SARC, or ASEAN? Especially uh, ASEAN is the uh, uh, oldest and historical, uh, very strong, good governance. So I'd like to ask each person uh, shortly. Um, what is the secret of success and how to conquer the problem uh, contemporary? Thank you very much. So from Professor Mieno, please. Uh, yes, and uh, it's a very, very tough question, I think. And, and uh, also, uh, yet, uh, I think it's a very uh, discriminatory view from the Professor Harbour is that I always see that Asia, but uh, compared with that, uh, the other, the other, country, other regions that Asia is uh, a little better. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, I, I'm not. I have not a very uh, prompt question, a very answer to that. But uh, uh, at least at the, see, in the regions that the, the challenge, uh, some particular challenge are shared. Mm -hmm. 
in, in considerations, like on the even in that uh, the conflict uh, uh, countries, like on the current China and Japan mm -hmm. and uh, Southeast Asian countries, and um, the stability of the financial system is anyway uh, needed, and uh, uh, the uh, low tax. Uh, uh, trade is inevitable uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, gives them the uh, it's um, uh, the beneficial for everyone, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of that, uh, the 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 one secret might be in that uh, in this our Asian regions that that uh, uh, still have a common interest, common challenges mm -hmm. uh, shared by all the members. Right. That might be one point. Okay, Thanks. excellent answer. Thank you very much, Professor Mieno. Okay, so now, um, Professor Pope, uh, Chris Pope, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Um, okay, can you see you. me? Is mm -hmm. it okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. No problem. My view on this is that there needs to be a global surplus recycling mechanism, which allows uh, rich nations to uh, uh, move surplus to developing and deficit nations. Um, in order to do this, I think it's necessary to have a mechanism that regulates mm. surplus and uh, deficits also. Uh, I argued that this uh, it's possibly time to talk about a new monetary regime based on the bank or maybe even an adaptation of the uh, uh, special drawing rights, which uh, means that uh, uh, well, it could. Uh, it, it means that surpluses aren't recycled solely based on geopolitical um, considerations, but also economic ones. Okay. Um, I also think uh, a global currency that's not the U.S. dollar would allow the world to be guided. Uh, would guide the world towards long-term investments mm -hmm. and stepping away from the shareholder value maximization model, which means that corporations have to um, uh, generate profit at every single uh, business quarter. If the world is, if businesses, private sector is um, genuinely able to invest long term into things, then this is a, um, a platform, a springboard upon which uh, a real um, integrated uh, green growth um, uh, movement can uh, can be generated or can yes. depart, uh, can can get going, and uh, uh, in this situation it's important to regulate monetary and money markets um, through institutions like the bank for international settlements uh, if there was a global currency because this could stop um, currency hedging and the under uh, short selling and things like this to undermine currencies and currency regimes and uh, I also think if uh, green growth is important uh, if, if we are the biggest thing that uh, we face in the future is climate change anyone with children will surely be concerned about this uh, if we are really going to um, move towards a um, environmentally sustainable model of economic growth, it's important to step back from financialization in order to enrich people, mm -hmm. um, give people money from wh on which they can spend uh, on um, uh, they, they can consume green products and generate through demand the transition to a green economy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very intensive answer. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. So, Professor Park, thank you very much. Yeah, we three countries has very many problem, a historical problem, but uh, perhaps economically we could collaborate together, like which you uh, spoke about that. Thank you. Yes. First of all, I like to uh, mention. As Professor Hava pointed out, the three East Asian countries, mm -hmm. such as China, Japan, and Korea, account for around 85% of entire East Asian uh, economic output. Mm -hmm. So without close cooperation between these three nations, East Asian cooperation cannot be realized. But unfortunately, at the same time, East Asian three major countries are pretty much divided by two different political systems, mm. such as uh, communism and democracy. Mm. But fortunately, on the other side, we share the common interest in terms of economies, so-called capitalism. Mm. 
-hmm. Although China uh, is pursuing socialism, the Chinese economic system is regarded as red capitalism or state-driven capitalism. Mm -hmm. So at the least, we have a, a common interest, as like Professor Mieno pointed out. And at the same time, we share the common challenges. Therefore, it is very wise for us to divide the political interest and economic interest, mm -hmm. separate for a while until we share our economic interest to a high, highest extent. It is very interesting. East Asia is one of the tripart major economic power mm -hmm. at the global scale, along with European Union, as well as North America. But only East Asia is divided by the different political systems. Yes. So this is, this is a, one of the weakest point uh, mm -hmm. for East Asia. Mm -hmm. So the how to overcome, as uh, you pointed out, is political the uh, common interest will take a much longer time than economic common interest. Therefore, in the short run, we have to focus on common economic interest as well as uh, tackle on the common economic challenges from outside. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. You are completely right and exact. Yes, we can start from the economic collaboration, not a political one. Uh, we'd like to political reconciliation uh, to a very long time collaboration in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your excellent answer. Thank you. So the lastly, how uh, do you answer uh, Professor Chow Han? Southeast Asia, South Asia is also a very huge region and um, some successful uh, uh, case about the SARC and the beam stick, but uh, you already spoke about the uh, problem with India, Pakistan, or now the uh, territory India and China as well. So how to solve this very difficult question? <laughs> It's very, really difficult question. If you could answer this uh, uh, question, then I think uh, the Asian integration can flourish and can be, uh, we can say, best in the world. Although Professor Miano, Professor Pope, and Ma, if I combine all the three, they try to give the right uh, answer, mix of everything. Uh, from my mind, actually, although we consider European Union one of the best integration, which is highly institutionalized, but uh, Asian integration, if you see, is emerging from uh, out of this institutionalized mechanism also, which is more based on market, which is more based on like uh, earlier, my colleagues replied, like on the basis of economics, on the financialization, like the mm -hmm. banking and different kind of transportation. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in the basis of all these, this Asian integration, uh, which is emerging, if we support it with the uh, least. Uh, uh, mechan uh, institutional mechanism. I think uh, it can be even better than European Union uh, if uh, uh, we develop some mechanism uh, even to sort out some issues like uh, as uh, Professor Park was mentioning about the three countries, China, Korea, and Japan. And if I extend it from East Asia to even South Asia and mm -hmm. India, these four mm -hmm. countries can be very important in the whole mm -hmm. uh, Asian integration. So some uh, mechanism, in addition to like Professor Pope, Professor Nano mentioned uh, about the people we should take, uh, uh, should take consideration about the poor people, uh, backward regions, 
and with the some me uh, common uh, mechanism of sorting out these issues of border like peace and security i think it can be the really best uh, integration uh, emerging from i think i'm saying that from the market from the trade flows from investment from finance from banking from transportation and people to people contact cultural collaboration good uh, integration okay thank you very much yes um all of uh, uh presenters said um in asian economy is very organized in a financial system banking system or fta or collaboration of many uh, economic trade organizations so from such point of view we could start to construct the regional collaboration so it is really very interesting uh, session thank you very much all of the presenters and thank you very much uh, uh, all of the audiences to hear uh, and diva to this session thank you very much for coming to uh, have a presentation great presentation thank you very much okay thank you thank you <laughs> thank you very, very much, much. Thank you. Next, Bye. next session start from uh, uh, five thirty. Uh, sorry, five forty. So uh, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.